One of the key things about Bush is that the private Bush was an intensely emotional man. He cried at the drop of a hat. Still does. You know, there could be a heavy dew outside and he will weep. <laughs> um, but the country didn't see that very much. They saw a man they thought was out of touch. They saw a man they thought didn't understand a supermarket scanner. They saw a man who they believed to be a rich man out of tune with recessionary times. The reality is that this was a man who Bill Clinton may have said, I feel your pain. George Bush really did. He just didn't think that it was the role of a president to emote all the time. You know, he thought that, as he put it, you know, you're just damn lucky to be there. You should do your job and be the president. And you can argue that was naive. You can argue it was out of tune with the times. He certainly paid the ultimate political price for it. But you know, in an age now where everyone's emoting all the time in real time, uh, all over social media and all over uh, our culture, you know, the appeal of a, of a dignified World War II combat veteran, congressman, ambassador to the United Nations, ambassador to China, director of the CIA, vice president, and president, has a lot to recommend it. I'm Lillian Cunningham with The Washington Post, and this is the 40th episode of Presidential. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. That was the voice at the beginning of the episode of historian John Meacham. He has a biography of George Herbert Walker Bush that came out recently called Destiny and Power. And we'll talk to him in a bit. But first, we'll talk with another Bush scholar, Jeffrey Engel. He's the director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University down in Texas. And he also has been studying Bush for years. So... What is this episode going to be about? Well, I thought we'd focus with both of them on dissecting the type of leadership, unique type of leadership that George H.W. Bush had, which we don't associate very much with the presidency. It's a quiet type of leadership, a leadership that isn't personality driven, that isn't really based on emotion and larger than life charisma. It's a leadership style that's actually based on a much older, more traditional concept of public service. It's maybe fitting that that was the style of George H.W. Bush, given that he was our last American president who served during World War II. He is the one who closed the book on the Cold War. And he's the one who ultimately was charged with handing the presidency over to the next generation, the baby boomer generation, the me generation. So, Jeff. Okay, here we go. Uh, Bush was born in 1924. He grew up in New England, kind of splitting his time between his family's home in Greenwich, Connecticut, their summer home on the coast of Maine, the exclusive boarding school he went to, Phillips Academy, which was in Massachusetts. So let's uh, dive into his story. Thanks so much for helping to tell it, Jeff. This is a pleasure. You know, to start, I'd love to hear what you think drove him. So what were some of the most formative aspects of his childhood that um, help us better understand his character and who he later will be as a president? Sure. You know, there's there's really two key aspects to George Bush's personality that we can see from his childhood that, that really drives him throughout his political career, his business career, and all the way through his, his White House career. And those two are found in his upbringing. They are a sense of social responsibility um, and also a sense of competitiveness. Um, he comes from a very, very well-to-do family and a very well-connected family. His father, of course, is ultimately a United States senator, 
Um, he has bankers and industrialists on both his mother's and his father's side, and therefore was able to grow up in a world of what we would consider to be today great privilege, but also a world that believed that those to whom much is given have a greater responsibility to pay back society through public service and through public works and through public good. Um, and at the same time, uh, the Bushes and his mother in particular are a remarkably competitive family. They constantly believe in striving to be the best, in, in bettering themselves, and frankly, in winning. Um, one great example of this that I love is that his father, Prescott Bush, the United States Senator from Connecticut, actually becomes Dwight Eisenhower's favorite golfing buddy. And the reason that he is his favorite golfing buddy is because, as Ike put it, uh, Prescott's the only one who wouldn't let me win. Uh, that when you're a president, people just sort of give you a mulligan, they give you whatever shot you want, no big deal. So when you combine these two things, you have a real sense of a man from his very beginning, from his childhood, who both wanted to do something good for society and also believed that he was the one who should do something good for society because of that competitive spirit. Mm. So um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that sense of public service. Mm -hmm. He would end up being our last American president to have served in World War II. Are there particular aspects of his leadership style and his view of the world that, you know, you can look at later and say, like, yep, those definitely bear the imprint yes. of a man who came of age during World War II. Y yes, most definitely. I mean, World War II is clearly a formative experience in, in his life. And he is in high school at a very elite private uh, boarding school when Pearl Harbor happens. And immediately goes and with his graduating class to join up. George Bush winds up being placed in a very um, special and, and privileged slot uh, to become a naval aviator, winds up being the youngest naval aviator in the entire uh, Pacific theater, um, and is a bomber pilot, and really learns from that experience, I think, a good sense of teamwork. The, the United States military in World War II is a massive organization, and nothing happens because of one person's singular act. And consequently, Bush, I think, really learns that you have to do your own part and that the team is ultimately what matters. That is, the ship's victory is what matters. The battle uh, victory is what matters. The whole nation's victory is what matters. Um, there's another seeming experience that he has during the war in particular. Uh, he flies combat missions and unfortunately suffers the experience of being shot down on September 2nd of 1944 uh, in a bombing run over the island of Chichijima. And two of his crewmates, there's a three-member three member crew, two of his crewmates perish in that attack. Uh, and in fact, the whole experience haunts Bush throughout the rest of his life, where he wakes up at night asking himself what more he could have done. He talks about how the, fa the fact that he can constantly see their faces uh, basically stuck in that moment in 1944. And therefore, when he becomes commander-in-chief as president and has to send soldiers into harm's way, and in particular, given the nature of warfare at the time, has to send bomber pilots uh, into enemy airspace, he really has a personal sense of what that means. He knows what it's like to fly in a cockpit uh, with darkness all around you with, with the enemy in front. And so takes his responsibilities as commander in chief as seriously as, as any, I would argue, but also with a greater sense of personal responsibility as well. Um, so I'm going to just pause here for one second and ask you a question that I've asked on every podcast episode and it's silly but I think it helps sort of paint a portrait mm -hmm. um, if I knew nothing about George H.W. Bush and I was set up on a blind date with him <laughs> Jeff you know this guy don't you Like, sure. what should I expect um, uh, I have a daughter um, <laughs> and I would be very pleased uh, and the reason is that he is a remarkably nice man a remarkably polite man and a remarkably respectful man. He is sort of classically well brought up. One could even argue that he is the last quintessential gentleman of an old style to become president of the United States. Um, one of the things that's really important about Bush as a human being is the value that he puts on loyalty, and but also on friendship. He was once asked why he should be president of the United States. And he said, well, I have lots of friends. And he approaches the world wherein he makes it his point to make everybody his friend. 
And so I, I think if you're going on a blind date with George Bush, you're going to find a person who opens the door for you, uh, is very polite and, and um, would actually listen when you talk. He may not be the most scintillating <laughs> date you ever go on, but you're not going to worry. I, I will never forget. I, I had uh, was having lunch with President and Mrs. Bush when I was researching them. So a young historian. Um, and we were in a restaurant. This is after he's been retired, of course, from the presidency for almost for more than a decade at this point. And he noticed at the next table was a young man who was sitting by himself, looking very nervous. The young man's date showed up for lunch and the young man stood up and pulled the chair out for his date, very respectful and, and so on and so forth. And Bush watched this entire experience and he went up to the young woman after the end of the meal and said, I want you to tell your father that this young guy is a good guy. Tell your dad that George Bush approves uh, <laughs> and just walked off. That's a great story. Um, so skip ahead a little bit in his chronology to his time in Texas in the oil industry. What character traits of his or worldviews of his do you think congeal during that time? How did Texas shape him? Yeah, Texas, Texas plays a huge role in his life. He comes out after, after World War II service and after going to, to Yale on an accelerated track for returning veterans and comes to Texas in 1948. And what's really interesting about his decision to come to Texas is that it is a good representation of who he is. Because on the one hand, he firmly believed that he wanted to make his own way in the world. He didn't want to just go into banking with his father or with his uncles. At the same time, he showed up in Texas with a lot of lines of credit from bankers from Wall Street who were friends of his family. So he was a person who at once wanted to have the adventure of making things on his own, but was not so interested in doing things on his own that he was willing to turn his back on things that would make his life easier. So uh, he spends a, a significant time in Texas as, an, as a wildcatter, does actually quite well, um, but ultimately decides to move his family down to Houston, away from the oil fields in order to move his business into offshore drilling, but also, I think, in large part, because um, he was a cosmopolitan, urban, East Coast person, and Houston provided a, a more cosmopolitan lifestyle. Um, and it is in Houston that he winds up ultimately deciding to run for office. And it's very interesting to look at his campaign speeches from that first campaign running for Senate in 1964, where he describes in great lack of detail what it is he thinks America should do. You know, he, we should believe in freedom. We should believe in democracy. We should believe in capitalism. There's very little detail about what he wants to do because he basically is saying, elect me, I'm the right kind of person to be in office and I will do a good job working within the system. Um, he's a man who knew he wanted to be elected more than knew what he wanted to do once elected. George Bush lost that first Senate race, and it was far from the only loss that he would experience. He also lost his second attempt at a Senate seat. He was passed over as Gerald Ford's pick for vice president, which a lot of people thought he would get. And he lost the 1980 presidential election against Ronald Reagan before becoming Reagan's vice president. Beyond the political, though, he also had a number of personal losses. We talked about the deaths of his crew members in the war, which continued to haunt him. But an even more profound loss was the death of his daughter, Robin, who died of leukemia when she was three years old. And Bush still, actually to this day, keeps a picture of her on his desk. And so something that emerges again and again in Bush's life is this idea of resilience. That with every personal and political loss, he finds a way forward. He doesn't forget, but he is basically willing to dust himself off and move forward very quickly. Back to how you were, you were saying that he sort of has this interesting pairing of a real sense of service and teamwork and helping others, and that's paired with, you know, a very competitive, ambitious streak. How did those reconcile within him? You know, were those two mm -hmm. um, traits or instincts ever at odds with each other? Uh, yeah, they really were at odds with each other and ultimately wind up becoming a real difficulty for his 
own personal political career because let, let me let's take a step back for a second and think about the type of, of man or woman who wants to become president of the United States. One has to presume an incredible sense of ego and hubris. There are several hundred million people in this in this country, and you have to believe that only you are qualified and only you are best qualified to be commander in chief, not only of the country but also of the most powerful nation in the world. So Bush has that sense that he is a, a leader who has、uh, a responsibility and the capacity. To lead the nation and believes in many ways that he was raised to to be this person. At the same time, however, he is a team player and believes very deeply in loyalty, both to his subordinates but also to his superiors. So he spends a lot of time in Washington,、um, basically serving other presidents.、Uh, he is、uh, United Nations ambassador. He is、um, chairman of the Republican National Committee. During Watergate,、uh, an experience which was particularly difficult for him because he really had no inkling or responsibility of what Nixon had done during Watergate, but it was his job to go out and defend the president to the press every single day, and did so very loyally,、uh, and ultimately demonstrates his loyalty over eight years as Ronald Reagan's vice president. And what this really means at the end of the day. Is that you have a man who has a great sense of competitiveness that he needs to be in charge, who is willing to subsume that desire to be in charge whenever it's necessary to serve his superior, and that creates an image without throughout Washington and the country that perhaps he's a man who has no political backbone of his own, that he wants to lead but doesn't necessarily have the values. That a Reagan does, or that a Barry Goldwater does,、uh, that a person who understands not only why they should lead, but what they want to do with their leadership, and this creates in many ways an image that Bush, as the political critics of 1988 when he ran for president termed it, that he is in fact a wimp, a person without any convictions of his own. So, in a sense, the the, the idea of being、um, responsible for leadership, but also being responsible for the team. Really helps to undermine his own sense of political identity、uh, throughout the 1980s. So, and so, do you think that that、um, his sort of willingness to be loyal in that way and work toward other people's visions came out of his family, came、mm. out of、uh, World War II it, experience? You know, I, I think to, to understand George Bush. Fundamentally, one needs to appreciate that he is conservative to the core, and I don't necessarily mean politically. I mean in every facet of his life, because here is a man for whom the United States and democracy and free markets and capitalism have been very, very good to him and his family. So things work, and there is very little reason, therefore, for radical change. Because he's not a man who suffered oppression throughout his life, he's not a man who has seen great hardship throughout his life. As far as he's concerned, everywhere he looks, the country is doing better and the country is doing well because he and his family are doing well. And if those around him would just be more like him and his family, they too would do well.、Um, and so he actually was very, very adamant during his throughout his political career, but in particular, I'd focus on his. Political campaign of 1988, when he is running for the presidency and trying to get out of Reagan's shadow after eight years of being his vice president, he says,、uh, "I do not aim to lead a revolution. I do not want to radically change the country. I believe that we know what works: freedom works, democracy works, free markets works, capitalism works. As long as we keep to our deepest, most、uh, tried and true values, as he saw them." Um, the United States would continue to prosper. So his leadership is remarkably lacking in innovation、um, by its very definition, and he would not take that, I think, as an insult because he, his idea of, of leadership was to take what, after two hundred years, were the best practices of American democracy and make sure that they were allowed to to flourish. And it's very interesting to look at the organizations that he runs. We can't really find any. Bush doctrine, or any great legislative record, or anything that shows a dramatic desire to change the organizations that he's in, he rather believes that he should be leading them responsibly. So, I'll give you a good example. When Bush took up directorship of the CIA、uh, in 1975, this is an organization that was
suffering dramatically after after Vietnam. It was suffering after congressional investigation, and their reputation had sunk dramatically. And Bush walked in on the first day and essentially said to his staffers, what are they trying to do to us? The us there is what's really key, that he immediately identified that his responsibility as head of this organization was to protect and defend and better the organization. And consistently, he demonstrated a real knack for showing up in difficult moments and riding the ship through his, basically through his belief in organization and through his belief in the the American system. So, um, I mean, when you look at Bush's resume before the presidency, he's a congressman, an ambassador to the U.N., chairman of the Republican National Committee, an envoy to China, director of the CIA, vice president. Looking at that, it, it reminds me a lot of the sort of trajectories that we saw way back with some of the earliest presidents, you know, Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, even like James Buchanan, where they'd served in all of these government roles before Right. You know, assuming the presidency. Um, so I'm curious what you think accounts for that trajectory for Bush. Like, was it strategic about building a portfolio and kind of plotting his rise? Or do you think it was the opposite, that he was actually just adaptable and flexible, you know, and kind of took opportunities as they came up? Yeah, that's just to reinforce the the point. It is really important to recognize that Bush has what is arguably the single best resume for any man to or woman to enter the, the Oval Office um, in American history. I think if you go through the 20th century, the only person who rivals his resume is perhaps Dwight Eisenhower, um, who, of course, had a completely different trajectory going through the military. Um, but here's a man who has served in, in every capacity. He has served numerous presidents. He has served in the legislature and served diplomatically and served politically. And that service is really key. At every step along the way, he is not necessarily creating, I think, a ladder that's going to get him to the White House, but he is creating a ladder up. When he loses the nomination fight in 1980 to Ronald Reagan, Bush is very willing at that point to say, you know, I've been on the campaign trail for a better part of a year criticizing this man, but sure, I'll be his second in command. And writes in his diary that, um, this is Bush writing, that uh, I intend to be a vice president whom the president never has to worry about, that he should never have to look over his shoulder, that he should always know I've got his back and I will be a good wingman. And of course, I know what it means to be a real wingman. Um, and consequently, he's constantly looking for the next challenge and the next way forward and willing to put the past in the past in order to, to drive forward. All right. So Bush serves for eight years as Ronald Reagan's vice president. And then in 1988, it's finally his turn. And he's about as aware as anybody that his leadership persona is very different from his charismatic predecessor. I may be, may not be the most eloquent, but I learned that all, early on that eloquence won't draw oil from the ground, and I may sometimes be a little awkward, but there's nothing self-conscious in my love of country. And I'm a quiet man, but... I'm a quiet man. But I hear the quiet people, others don't. This is a clip from his speech in New Orleans when he accepted the Republican presidential nomination in 88. For seven and a half years, I've worked with a great president. I've seen what crosses that big desk. I've seen the unexpected crisis that arrives in a cable in a young aide's hand. And I've seen the problems that simmer on for decades and suddenly demand resolution. And I've seen modest decisions made with anguish and crucial decisions made with dispatch. And so I know that what it all comes down to this election, what it all comes down to after all the shouting and the tears is the man at the desk. And who should sit at that desk? My friends, I am that man. (laughs) 
Bush goes on to win the election and the great challenge before him as he takes over that desk in the Oval Office in 1989 is that the Cold War is on the verge of ending, but it's not quite there yet. So, um, Jeff, the end of the Cold War and the demise of the Soviet Union both do end up happening under Bush. But how exactly did he navigate that transition? And, you know, what looked different about his approach than Reagan's? Yeah, I think this ultimately winds up being his greatest achievement as president and the reason that we should remember his presidency. Other leaders would have uh, essentially leapt into the breach and tried to foment change and try to radically alter the world because of their great power as president of the United States. Bush's greatest achievement was simply to do nothing. And I don't mean that in a lazy way, but from Bush's perspective... And think back to what we discussed before about his sense of America. Bush's perspective was that democracy and capitalism and free markets were all a good thing. And here, as he takes up the presidency, he looks around the world and recognizes that the entire world seems to be agreeing with the United States. The Soviet Union itself, our great enemy, has decided to become more democratic. If you look at China, where ultimately we see a crackdown on democratic protest at Tiananmen Square in June of his first year, only a few months after he takes office, it is on the one hand a crackdown, but it's also a demonstration that China too is, is becoming more democratic or that the, the urge for democracy is growing. So from Bush's perspective, if everything is going right in the world, if you're winning, don't change the rules of the game. Uh, so whenever Bush saw change within the Soviet Union or saw protests behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany and Hungary and Poland, Czechoslovakia, his response was simply to say, let's do as little as possible because if we do something, we could screw this up. What that typically meant was, let's not say anything because uh, people around the world listen to what the President of the United, St United States says. And if I come out too strong as president in favor of the Democratic protesters, that might give more credibility to the communist governments that are, are tottering and frightened to use force to crack down. So as Bush approached the end of the Cold War, he did so very skeptically, very cautiously, very prudently, but also with a sense that let's allow the stream of history that demonstrates that we are winning to keep rolling. I mean, you started to mention it there with prudence and caution, but um, what would you list as some of the key traits that defined Bush's leadership style as president, whether in his dealings with the end of the Cold War or elsewhere in his presidency? You know, there's, there's several. Um, prudence and skepticism is one. A, a reliance on and a belief in personal diplomacy and, and diplomatic friendship is another. That is, Bush, uh, having been a figure on the world stage for more than a generation at this point, frankly had an incredible Rolodex and was able and willing to call up leaders around the world and talk to them and, more importantly, listen to them. Um, the other thing that I think was really quite impressive about Bush's leadership is, despite everything I just said about him being a cautious leader and a prudent leader and a leader who was willing to, to let the world move in the direction which he thought was successful for the United States, he was able to isolate the things he thought were really crucial. And the most important of those, to my mind, was his belief at the, at the end of the Cold War that the United States needed to maintain an active role in Europe, even with the Cold War ending. And here we have to go back and understand his sense of history and the sense of history of those around him from his generation, the World War II generation. And the lesson which Bush and those around him took from this was that as long as Americans were overseas and actively able to keep inter-allied problems from rising into squabbles, into wars, into conflicts, as long as the United States basically was the strongest presence and the strongest kid on the block, war would not return. And consequently, when the end of the Cold War becomes apparent at the end of 1989 and 1990, when Germany appears to be on the verge of unifying after having been divided since World War II, one side communist, one side democratic, there is some suggestion that Germany should become neutral. Bush found this idea completely appalling. 
Um, he didn't believe that NATO could survive without Germany, Germany, which provided the largest manpower addition to NATO and also where most of NATO's bases, key bases, were stationed. And he didn't think that the United States could maintain a role in Europe if NATO failed to exist. So at the end of the day, he made it his singular purpose to ensure that Germany was able to unify within NATO. Those negotiations were very complex, were very detailed, and also very much behind the scenes. But ultimately, Bush made it a requirement of American support with the Germans, with the Soviets, with the French, and with the British, that the only way the United States would allow this to go forward would be if the United States got to stay in NATO in Europe. So with a whole universal global crisis going on about what the future of the world should look like, Bush was able to isolate one thing that he thought crucial, that is American leadership, and was able to maintain it. And I mean, yeah, he's the first president in decades and decades who had to look out on the world, a world that wasn't black and white any longer, that wasn't just seen in terms of U.S. versus Soviet. Something which happens after German unification is the Gulf War. Um, The first time, of course, the United States puts major combat forces into the Middle East. And this is really a a critical moment for Bush to describe what he ultimately winds up calling the New World Order. And Bush's sense of a post-Cold War world was essentially Franklin Roosevelt's um, at the end of World War II. It was a world in which the great powers sanctioned by the United Nations would work together cooperatively to keep the peace and to respect sovereignty around the world. And in Bush's interpretation of the world, Roosevelt's vision in 1945 had just simply never been able to be implemented because the Cold War got in the way. So when Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait uh, in August of 1990, Bush's response is to deploy U.S. military force, but simultaneously to go to the United Nations to get sanction. That is, to get the United Nations and global opinion on his side, uh, that this is something that should be done to protect not only Kuwait itself, but more broadly and very explicitly to say, in the post-Cold War world, if we allow one nation to gobble up another, that's going to be a really bad lesson. We're defining the rules of the game going forward into the 21st century. And the thing that matters most in the 21st century is going to be respect for borders, respect for sovereignty, and respect for international opinion as embodied in the United Nations, which will finally get to operate as we always dreamed. Uh, So Bush's actions in the Middle East in particular really give us a hint of how he hoped the world would operate. Now, I, I do have to say... Um, this is a vision that is reliant upon force. This is not a utopian vision. So the post-Cold War world was not going to be free of conflict, was not going to be peaceful. It was just simply going to be better than what had come before. What would you kind of give as the big takeaway for why it was that the Gulf War was able to be short and successful in a way that, you know, subsequent U.S. engagements in the Middle East haven't been? Yeah, uh, th- th- there's two answers to that. <laughs> and and th- the first listeners can decide is either the best thing Bush did or the worst thing Bush did. And that is with Saddam Hussein's forces on the ropes, um, with the United States and its allies being extremely successful in liberating Kuwait and marching towards Baghdad, Bush and his advisors decided to halt the war because their sense of the United Nations sanction was simply that their only responsibility was to liberate Kuwait, not to defeat Iraq. So they thought going into Baghdad and taking over Iraq would be a violation of their international rule. But secondly, they had an expectation that Saddam Hussein, um, that there would be a a coup against him, that there would be an uprising against him, that his own people would take care of this problem. Obviously, that didn't happen. James Baker, who was George Bush's Secretary of State during his entire administration, was asked in 2006 what he thought about the, you know, going on to Baghdad. And he said, you know, what's really interesting is that people used to ask me why we didn't go all the way to Baghdad and take over Iraq. He said, nobody asks me that anymore. And the reason is that he said what we feared would happen is what happened under the next President Bush. That is a long-term occupation where Americans were seen as, frankly, as occupiers, as a foreign force and not as a force of liberation. 
Um, and I think that that speaks to a broader sense of the difference between the two Bush administrations in many ways. The George H.W. Bush administration believes strongly that history was moving in our direction, so therefore we would do best by doing as little as possible. The second Bush administration, the W administration, after 9-11, simply believed that that was too slow, that we didn't have the opportunity to wait for history to move in our direction. We had to catalyze it. We had to go in and move it ourselves. One thing I find interesting in terms of sort of his leadership qualities and personality is that, you know, there's this vision that we get of a calm and careful person, um, very prudent, as you say. And yet at the same time, he seems often very fixated on not wanting to appear weak. He really is a remarkably old-fashioned guy, Um, but he also was very human behind the scenes. He will cry if a kitten walks in front of him, basically, you know, and, and he feels emotions very deeply. But when the cameras are on, he thinks that that's not the proper role for a president. He really believed in being very, very buttoned up and very old fashioned uh, in how he presented the, the White House and how he presented the presidency. And so one of the things that we're seeing now that we have greater access to the archives and greater access to the records of his administration is just how hands-on and emotional and sometimes very frequently angry uh, he was as a president, but that he was very able to keep that behind the scenes. And the most famous example was the night that the Berlin Wall fell. The Berlin Wall is the single greatest symbol of communism and of the Cold War that exists bar none. And around the world, because of satellite television, people are now able to turn on their TV and see East and West Germans together dancing on top of the wall, which means, essentially, we've won the United States. They're not dancing because they're going to become communists. They're dancing because they have chosen freedom. Thousands and thousands of West Germans come to make the point that the wall has suddenly become irrelevant, something, as you can see, almost a party on. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? Senators go to the Senate floor and proclaim victory in this half-century-long conflict. And Bush is even urged by many to go to Berlin and give a triumphant speech. And uh, Bush is told by his press secretary, Marlon Fitzwater, you know, you need to make a statement to the press. The press is going to need you to say something. Bush ultimately concedes that point, recognizes he can't stay silent. They invite the, the press in around his desk. And Bush does a remarkable job over the next 30 minutes of saying absolutely nothing. The United States part of this, which is not related to this development today particularly. And the reason he said absolutely nothing was because he didn't, he knew that Gorbachev and other foreign leaders were essentially freaking out uh, over this incredible change that had occurred unexpectedly. And nobody quite knew what it was going to mean. And was it ultimately going to mean civil war in East Germany? And was it ultimately going to be in a global war? This is a really very dangerous moment in history. Um, And Bush was able to take the hit politically of appearing on American television almost uninterested in what was going on. In fact, one of the reporters, Leslie Stahl, said to him, Mr. President, you don't seem very elated. You don't seem very emotional. And Bush turned to her and said, well, I guess I'm not an emotional guy. The fact that I'm not bubbling over, maybe it's it's, uh, get along towards evening. And that was the video clip that was played on American television afterwards that sort of demonstrated that he was a buttoned up person who couldn't even be bothered by this notion that we just won the Cold War. When in reality, he knew that he was getting frantic telegrams and phone messages from global leaders who were concerned that war was on the horizon and that he knew that everything he said publicly was going to exacerbate tensions and that his responsibility had to be to work quietly behind the scenes. The night he lost the election, uh, he's sitting in suite 271 of the Houstonian Hotel, which is where he stayed in in Houston. Mrs. Bush is asleep. Uh, He gets up out of the bed. He goes into the living room and picks up his micro cassette recorder, which is how he kept his diary. And he's whispering into the machine because he doesn't want to wake Mrs. Bush up. And he says that he honestly doesn't understand what just happened. Uh, He doesn't understand how the country turned from someone who had served 
in World War II to someone who had, in Bush's view, dodged the draft and been duplicitous about it, his word, duplicitous, about his anti-war activities during Vietnam. He feels the tectonic plates of American life shifting. Uh, he worries about vulgarity. He worries about a coarsening of the culture. He worries that the ideal of service, the old order, uh, was breaking down. It's a little self-serving, but it's heartfelt. He genuinely did not have the capacity to process how the country would go from him to Bill Clinton. So let's back up now and process that ourselves. Um, why did the country turn its back on his leadership? And maybe the first place we can look for that answer is in what was happening domestically while all these foreign policy victories were taking place. So to start, there's this huge budget deficit, right? And it forces Bush to go back on the pledge that he made, the read my lips, no new taxes pledge. Why did he go back on it? Why? What was his reasoning for deciding to compromise and allow for a tax increase after he had said that there was no way he was going to do that? Sure. Uh, he said, read my lips during his acceptance speech uh, in New Orleans in uh, the summer of 1988. It was remarkable in part because George H.W. Bush was not known for many memorable public utterances. Uh, and so this pledge, which clearly aligned him with the increasingly conservative base of the Republican Party, with the supply siders, those who believe that tax cuts were the, the central litmus test, uh, was important. And we forget now, because the deficit, while huge, is not the top of mind, but it was top of mind then. It was seen as an existential threat to the country, to our military strength, to our position in the world. And so the deficit, on the one hand, was this compelling public issue. Uh, Bush had uh, pledged not to not to raise taxes, but he had a Democratic Congress. Both the House and the Senate were in Democratic hands. And by June of uh, 1990, basically the Democrats pushed and pushed and pushed. And uh, Bush found himself in a position to accept some tax increases in exchange for rules that would compel the future Congresses, future administrations to always account for more spending with either commensurate cuts or uh, higher taxes. And so it was a trade-off, it was a compromise, uh, but Bush believed it was in the national interest. He never really saw a, a huge connection between campaign promises and the realities of governing, hmm. uh, which hurt him uh, politically. He thought he was being a grown-up, but it uh, it broke uh, the Republican base, and uh, he paid a steep price for it. Hmm. And um, how do you think that that decision also fits with his personal definition of service and leadership and what his responsibility was as president to, you know, sort of serve the best interests of the nation? Well, my, my view of Bush is that while he was far from perfect, he did always, sometimes at the very end of the day, very late in the day, he did always try to put the country first. Uh, he had opposed the Civil Rights Act in 1964 when he was running for the Senate in Texas, but in 1968 when he was in the House, he voted for fair housing. Uh, he ran a, a brutal campaign against Michael Dukakis in 1988. But once he was actually president, he did everything he could to create a culture of compromise and consensus. He rather cynically made the no new taxes pledge. He didn't fully believe it, uh, I think, even when he made it, but broke it when he thought that the national interest called on him to put away that rhetoric and, and, and actually govern. He passed the Clean Air Act. He passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, he, he left his mark on the country, but part of this is based in his biography in his character. He had these, uh, the sense of, of the world as one in which, uh, crises were to be managed. And also importantly, he very much believed that there was virtue in preventing bad things from happening 
almost as much as there was in proactively doing good things. So, uh, you know, beyond the fact that the country was suddenly going through a horrible economic recession toward the end of his term, what else do you think was at the core of why he lost re-election? And, you know, a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, one was uh, he was living on borrowed historical time anyway. Uh, no sitting vice president had succeeded a president in a, in a normal election since Martin Van Buren succeeded Andrew Jackson in 1836. Um, there had been 12 years of one party White House rule. Uh, Americans tend to want to go eight years in one party, eight years the other, eight years, eight years. So the country in many ways was ready for a change. And Bush, I think, found himself buffeted by forces that continue to shape our politics even today, but which he didn't fully understand or didn't have the ability to master. One was the rise of reflexive partisanship. Newt Gingrich, who broke from him on the uh, budget deal, was someone who was a model of this new era of sort of a freestanding ideolog who saw his first mission, his first duty, not to supporting a president of his party, but to be true to the beliefs of the base. Another thing is the rise of confessional politics. Bill Clinton, I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. um, boxers or briefs. You know, but that was just totally an anthem of Bush. He didn't understand how you could have a culture where a president was talking about that kind of thing. Uh, so he was not relatable. And the third thing that I think is really important, and I think it continues to reverberate today, was the rise of cable television. We forget cable was a fairly new phenomenon. There were these burgeoning channels, these, these new means by which political figures could reach voters outside the ordinary channels of communication. And you saw Bill Clinton as a master of that, including late night entertainment, you know. And you saw in 1992, Ross Perot. Uh, tell me if this sounds familiar. <laughs> a, an unconventional billionaire businessman uh, with a gift for entertaining who struck a chord in an angry and restless populace. Huh. <laughs> That's a movie we've seen uh, since then. And Ross Perot was able to get his footing in the... Um, American politics of 1992 because of Larry King, because of that 9 to 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern time slot uh, on CNN, where Perot presented himself as this populist, common sense, Mr. Fix-It, and uh, really undercut the claims that Bush had to re-election. You know, what has happened in the two decades since that we've started to see this sort of positive revision of his time in office? He left office with only 37 percent of the vote, you know, a remarkable uh, dismissal. He received, as, as Churchill once put it, the order of the boot. Um, mm -hmm. Although what, one interesting detail is that all, it's, it's almost as though the country had a fever that broke right after the election, almost instantly in the fall of 1992, Bush's approval ratings start going up. It's almost as though we let out this angry scream and then we, not, I'm not saying we regretted it exactly, but we almost instantly began to appreciate Bush in a way that we had willfully almost uh, failed to appreciate him throughout 1992, which had been such a miserable year. So the view of Bush began to improve even before he left the White House. And I think that as uh, as the decades went by, the the things that people had criticized him for began to seem, with the perspective of years, to have been the right decisions. Uh, he was criticized by some uh, for not going into Baghdad, but we saw how difficult it was to occupy. Uh, people were upset by ever exacerbating failure of Washington to reach compromise on big issues. So suddenly his breaking the no new taxes pledge begins to look pretty good. Here's a guy who was willing to sacrifice political capital, sacrifice political standing to do something he thought was right. And so I think there was a, a nostalgia for, for Bush, but nostalgia suggests that it's warm, fuzzy, and, and not particularly well thought out. You know, there, 
there are sound historical, intellectual, philosophical reasons to appreciate with high regard the presidency of George H.W. Bush. And it's very hard for the political marketplace, either in real time or even in retrospect sometimes, to give adequate credit to presidents who prevent the worst from happening. But the end of the Cold War is an enormous achievement. It boggles the mind. If I had told you in 1981 that the Cold War was going to end, the Soviet Union was going to surrender, disintegrate, not even exist in 10 years, and nobody was going to fire a shot, you, you would have thought that was crazy. It was, not, it was not plausible. But George Bush brought that uh, conflict to, to a peaceful end. So George Bush, his story is hard to tell. You know, there are still people even today who don't really see him as significant a historical figure as I think he was. There's clearly a new public appreciation of his grace, of his dignity. There is an American weakness for elder statesmen. Mm -hmm. um, but we miss the point of Bush if we simply focus on his good manners and neglect the, the genuine historical legacy that he's left us. Many thanks to this week's guests, Jeffrey Engel and John Meacham. Original music for the podcast is by Dave Westner. So we have now reached the point in the American presidency where the torch has been passed to the baby boomers. We have only got a few more episodes to go. The next up is William Jefferson Clinton.